So I also want to start thanking Corey and Brian O'Meara and Tracy and Susan Perkins, who's not here, for organizing such an exciting session on in, um, empirical, theoretical, and gender issues in phylogenetics. It really turned out to be a really interesting session. I'm really enjoying listening to all the talks. So as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm going to be talking about lianas. And for the non-botanists in the audience, these are climbing plants. And they're really abundant and very diverse throughout the world. They have a key role in forest generation. They um, include, they encompass a lot of the species diversity that we see in tropical forests. And they're also really important for ecosystem level function. The first person to really pay attention to the importance of these uh, lianas was actually Charles Darwin, um, who got some seeds from Asa Gray and then planted those in his backyard and kept just following those plants and looking at how they were growing and made a series of really interesting ecological observations that led to the publication of this book on the movement and habits of climbing plants back in 1875. And even though he did so a lot of ecological observations on these plants, this also led to a series of evolutionary questions that he finishes his book, leaving these questions out. And some of these included, so what are the steps involved in the genesis of climbing plants? Also, do climbing plant plants ever lose the climbing habit? Or do climbing plants ever lose tendrils? How often did tendrils evolve? What are the adaptations associated with the climbing habit? And what are the steps involved in the modifications of leaves into tendrils? So at the time, there was still even a question of whether climbing plants formed a clade or, or how um, did that work. And years later, so we, once we got a phylogeny of the androsperms, it was clear that climbing plants evolved multiple times throughout the history of the androsperms and 97 times alone in the New World um, tropics. Um, one thing that is really interesting is that even though there's so many evolutions of the climbing habit, only a few lineages actually diversified. So this generates all kinds of questions why some lineages that are lianas diversified while others um, didn't. And also it provides us with multiple replicas throughout the endosperm phylogenies, which turns this group into a really interesting model to study diversity patterns in the tropics. However, working with climbing plants, even though they're a great model, it's not so easy. So imagine these plants are in the canopy of the tropical forest. So they are growing 40 meters above the floor. <laughs> So you can take like up to a whole day to collect a single specimen and things like that. So actually, in order to study these climbing plants, we need to focus in particular groups so we can gather really nice um, um, data sets before we can start making comparisons across the endosperm um, phylogeny. So my case study is the tribignoni, which is a neotropical group, includes nearly 400 species, and this is actually the most abundant and the most diverse group of lianas in several tropical forests. And it's really a great model for, um, it's really a great group to look at um, evolution of climbing habit and associated things. And even Charles Darwin and his group, he already noted the importance of his group, of this group, in the abstract of the group, of his uh, book. The group is very diverse in several respects. It has very unusual wood anatomy, a very different tendril morphology, very diverse flower morphology, and lots of insect plant interactions that I know some people will get excited about. And this was also the group that the late Al Gentry was working on. And for the botanists in the audience, you would know that he was really one of the most prominent botanists that we ever had. And he laid out a bunch of hypotheses about um, plant diversification, structure of different forest communities. And since, since Bignoniesi was his folk group, a lot of his hypotheses are based in Bignoniesi. Um, he published like over 350 papers during the 25 years that he worked on the Bignoniesi, which is really amazing. And you can see by some of the titles here, he looked at co-evolutionary patterns, he raised hypothesis, biogeographical hypotheses, community structure. So it was really, he really left this amazing set of hypotheses that were waiting to be tested. And so, and, for, and he 
passed away exactly when the phylogenetic revolution was uh, happening. And I'm actually embarrassed to say, but I have to admit that I'm old enough to have actually seen the phylogenetic revolution. And this is me collecting in Manaus in 90, back in 93. And at the time, I was an undergraduate, and the only angiosperm phylogeny that we had was this one that was published by Michael Donahue and Jim Doyle in 1989. So we had a morphological tree. We were still learning Cronquist. And I just wanted to put this in here for us to remember that this phylogenetic revolution is actually pretty. It happened not that long ago. And at around that time, we had the first angiosperm molecular phylogeny come out. And so it, at that time, they were still testing whether homomalities were monophyletic and things like that. And it was only in 98 that we had the first phylogeny published for the angiosperm by the angiosperm phylogeny group. And starting from then is when things started to be more stable in terms of angiosperm phylogeny. But this is just to remind us that this is so recent and there are all these methods coming out and things are changing really, really fast. So at the time, so when these phylogenies came out, it was just really this amazing tool. Okay, now we can test all these hypotheses in, about systematics and evolution and biogeography. They really provided this framework for us to finally test all these hypotheses that we had been wanting to test for a long time. And so this is when I was joining graduate school and eager to start to work on a phylogeny of tribignoni. And this phylogeny really provided like a wonderful um, framework for us to start to understand a series of diversity patterns in this group and also to test a lot of the theoretical methods that were coming out. So this phylogeny first provided us with a general view of geographical patterns in the group so we could see for instance that the group originated in the Atlantic forest of eastern Brazil at around 50 million years and then we have a major radi radiation in Amazonia, occupation of dry areas of central Brazil at around 30 million years, several reoccupations of the Atlantic forest. Um, this tree also provided us with a basis to establish a new generic classification for the group so until then we had many different systems, lots of things changing in terms of the classification of the group, and people couldn't reach a um, consensus on how to um, organize this complicated group. And so this phylogeny provided us with a basis to um, reorganize the classification into 21 monophyletic clades that are all diagnosed by good morphological features and provided the basis for a series of other um, taxonomic studies and which were all informed by um, uh, phylogenetic relationships. So it really helped us to solve these mysteries that had been going on for a long time, as well as allowed us to get a good understanding of general patterns of morphological evolution. So for us, for those of us working on, so doing empirical studies, this breadth of methods and it's just like a feast uh, try, allowing us to test these different hypotheses. So what I'm just going to do now is just to kind of walk you through some of the hypotheses that we were able to test using these uh, phylogenies using um, and applying different kinds of uh, theoretical methods. So for example, we were, so these are lianas and as I said, they have this very specialized wood anatomy and what is particularly interesting here is Again, for the non-botanists, you might remember that plants have a cambium that produces phloem to the outside and xylem to the inside. <laughs> and in this group, we have a series of oops, phloem wedges that are present in equidistant portions of the stem. And in some other species, we have like multiple flowing wedges and, and others even more complex systems. So initially, we wanted to understand the pattern of evolution of this strange wood anatomical trait. And we could see that the first lineage that diverged in the group actually had so this pattern with four flowing wedges. And it actually had so a continuous pattern, a continuous flowing, oh, I'm sorry, a continuous cambium 
And then we have a single evolution of this type of four flowing wedges. And at this stage, we then actually have a discontinuous flowing. I'm sorry, Cambrian. And so we start having a regular portion of the of the uh, cambium and a variant portion of the cambium that also leads to a regular flow and um, variant variant flow. We have a single evolution of this other wood anatomical type and a single evolution of this other type. And actually, when we looked at development of these structures, what we see is that each species actually follow all these different developmental stages and essentially some of the species actually stop early in development and don't go further in development. And so in the fact that each novel trait actually appear in subsequently more recent ancestors on the phylogeny suggests a recapitulatory um, history. We were then interested in looking in further detail, okay, so what is happening at the cell type with these different um, with the different portions of the phloem. And it turns out that the variant phloem is mostly composed of very wide sieve tubes and a high concentration of fibers, which means that these variant portions of the phloem actually have much higher conductivity and mechanical support, while the regular portions of um, the phloem actually have much more parenchyma um, and a higher number of wider rays and tiny sieve tubes, which actually leads to redu reduced conduction and higher storage capacity. So this is just to illustrate how we're starting to then so combine anatomical study with some um, um, comparative methods and using our phylogenetic framework to understand details about the morphological evolution in the group. And we went on taking a look at many different morphological traits. So for example, in the case of tendrils, we saw, we first reconstructed the condition, the pattern of evolution of tendrils in the group, and then we could see that the ancestral condition were trifid tendrils. So tendrils are these um, structures that help climbers to go up, right, for the non-botanists. And Everyone always thought that the ancestral condition would have been simple tendrils and that these structures would become more and more complex over time. But no, what we find is that the ancestral conditions are trifid tendrils and then you have multiple evolutions of the simple, simple tendrils happening in this group. And so we wanted again to go back to anatomy and to ontogeny and understand what was happening um, in terms of tendril development um, in this group. And what we did was to then study the ontogeny of a bunch of species that have had trifid tendrils nowadays, but whose immediate ancestors also had trifid tendrils. And then we could see first that these species, very early on in development, they would develop trifid tendrils. But then we also looked at, for example, species that had trifid tendrils but were nested within a lineage that had simple tendril ancestors. And in those cases, what we found was this, these species actually started developing as simple tendrils, and much later on in development, they would have the trifid tendrils. And the same hap thing happened when we have species with simple tendrils, with less nested in lineages with a simple tendril ancestor, or simple tendrils nested in lineages with, with trifid tendrils ancestors. So it was really allowing us to recapitulate sort of the history of a variety of different morphological features. We also looked at sort of then the genetic basis of these changes that were happening, happening in tendrils, and we chose to look at genes that were associated with um, partition in different leaf types, and since these tendrils are modified leaves, so we looked at three different genes, leafy floricaula, shoot meristemalis, and fantastica, and wanted to see the patterns of expression in those genes. And what we saw was that um, shoot meristemless um, was expressed in the meristem exactly where new tendril branches um, would development, would develop. And the overall pattern of expression of these three genes were associated with tendril uh, ramification and would also be more strongly expressed in the tendrils that presented the highest levels of ramification, which was similar to the patterns that we would see in 
partition of leaf development. So we were able to show that the same genes that were involved in, the, in leaf partition were also leading to um, leaf, to tendril partition. We were then interested in taking a look at the insect-plant interactions and seeing what was happening in, um, with those structures. So the first step was always to, was again to characterize these structures in detail. So we're always we build the phylogeny, then we're always like to go back to anatomy and really looking whether these patterns recovered with the phylogeny. We can whether these things recover. We can recover the same patterns with morphology. So the first thing was to characterize the extra floral nectaries and see what these things were. And it turns out the extra floral nectaries are actually trichomes. Um, so epidermical structures, and there are three main different types. So there are non-glandular non trichomes in those plants, and then there are also stipitate glandular trichomes and peltate glandular trichomes. And the peltate glandular trichomes are the ones that are the extra floral in those, um, in, those in this group. So we then wanted to see whether the evolution of these extra floral nectaries was also associated with changes in the selective regime and whether the evolution of these nectaries happened after the um, changes in different selective regimes. This is going back to some of the, um, so Jonathan Lossus and Alan Larson's predictions about, so what is an adaptation? So essentially we can only show that a particular trait is an adaptation if the character changed after the transitions of the particular selection regimes. And this is exactly what we wanted to do with the extra floral nectaries and see whether there were lots of changes in abundance of these extra floral nectaries and see whether these things always happened after these transitions to different um, savanna environments. And what we found was first that there was high homoplasy in extra floral abundance, which was the first step. We then saw that the changes in the abundance of extra floral nectaries were indeed associated with the habitat shifts. And these results are, of course, so consistent with um, an adaptation um, hypothesis. So this was one of the first steps trying to show that these extra floral nectaries were indeed um, adaptations. The second step then was trying to look at the extra floral nectaries and seeing, okay, so do they really have a function to protect against herbivory. And what we did in this study was then so to characterize the composition of substances that were selected by the extra floral nectaries. We then tested whether the extra floral nectaries really attracted ants, and then when we looked at whether the ants really presented a defensive role that led to reduced herbivory and increase in plant fitness. So we did find that the extra floral nectaries um, presented a significant role in ant attraction. However, to our surprise, the ants were actually not found to protect plants against herbivore attack. So we were really intrigued by, these, by this result and we thought, okay, let's expand our sampling. And so we did a much broader sampling in across the whole Espinhaço range, which is this region over here. It gets the states of uh, Minas Gerais and um, Bahia. And we sampled 10 different populations. And in those populations, so we quantified the amount, the abundance of the extra floral nectaries on those leaves and the impact of, um, well, then we also looked at the uh, community of ants that were visiting these extra floral nectaries. And we also looked at whether these ants were really protecting those plants. And then we looked at whether the production of fruits and fruit uh, germination. And what we found is actually that within a single species, there's a lot of variation in the abundance of the extra floral nectaries. And so we have some populations that have lots of extra floral nectaries. And these populations attract different types of ants. And these ants indeed have a role in protecting those plants against herbivory. While in other plants from the same species distributed across this range, they have much fewer amounts of extra floral nectaries. They attract a different, different kinds of ants that don't have a protective role. So essentially within the same species, we have cold spots and hot spots. And with 
the whole in with in the whole in the hot spots, these ants really have a protective role, and in the cold spots, they don't. So this is very consistent with the geographic mosaic theory of coevolution, in which you have this variation within a single species. The next step then is, is to see whether these traits are heritable or not. And so we're conducting a series of common garden experiments and we have all these plants growing and we'll see shortly whether this, is, this trait is heritable or not. So we're also interested in, take, in looking at the patterns of flower evolution. And then we, um, so we first started just doing a general study, looking at general patterns of evolution in discrete characters and we found a lot of homoplasy in those traits. We then looked at patterns of evolution in some continuous characters, and what we found was actually pretty interesting. We found that within the more external worlds, so in calyx and corollas, we found that there was phylogenetic conservatism, in, while in the traits associated with the more internal worlds of the flower, so androecium and ganoecium, there was a very high homoplasy. So essentially this says that a lot of, um, so the closely related species have flowers that have the same size, but actually the size of the internal worlds, gynoecium and androecium vary a lot. And this is probably what leads to um, um, isolation between these closely related species. So we then wanted to look at the evolution of all the flower as a whole, instead of looking at the individual traits and just looking at the whole thing to see what was happening and looking at patterns of phenotypic integration. And what we found was that the flowers have a very similar patterns of variance and covariance among traits. We also found that the evolution of the flower morphology actually occurred through the evolution of magnitudes of correlations among traits. This means that stabilizing selection actually seems to have played an important role in phenotypic integration, leading to a long-term stasis of covariance patterns. And what we think is that, so this long-term stasis in phenotypic integration is actually what allows us to distinguish patterns of formal morphology as distinct attributes of particular plant families. So this is probably, since there's a stasis in all the traits that are evolving in a correlated pattern, this is actually what leads us to say, oh, this is a melastomataceae flower, a bignoniaceae flower. So we found this for bignoniaceae. This has never been tested for other plant families, but we assume that this is probably something that would be recovered in other groups. So since we have this um, general understanding of patterns of uh, morphological variation, and we know that a good understanding of trait evolution is really important for understanding community assembly, we then wanted to take a look at the effect of phylogeny, environment, and morphology for the assembly of communities within these lianas. So the general objective of this study was to evaluate the role of environmental filtering and competition mediated by pollinators in these um, big known communities. So for that, we used a large data set made with um, transects made by Algentry. We also used uh, five different environmental layers that we got from WorldClim and we use the same discrete and continuous traits that we had already quantified in our studies of morphological evolution. So we first wanted to look at the impact of phylogeny on species co-occurrences, and so we tested whether species within communities were more or, or less related than expected by chance by using NRI and MTI, which are both implemented in phylocom. And overall, what we found is that the communities of Bignoni are not phylogenetically structured, so that means that the close relatives do not co-occur more or less uh, than expected by chance. We then wanted to look at the effect of floral morphology on the species co-occurrences, and we tested whether the distribution of species floral diversity within communities differ from random, and we found that the distribution of floral diversity in Bignoni did not differ from the null expectation that communities are assembly, assembled randomly in terms of their floral morphology, indicating that competition for pollinators was not driving community assembly. Then we looked at the abiotic preferences in habitat specialization. So we used PCAs to reduce our five variables into a smaller number of independent variables. We calculated the convex hole. Um, we created a null distribution of the convex hole and tested whether the species exhibit um, 
ecological specialization by checking whether the convex hole area differed from the null distribution. So what you can see here is that, so you see on, on the x-axis the number of communities with when, which a species were recorded, and then you see the convex hole distribution, this in gray, and you see the mean null distribution, and you can see that a lot of the species occupy these lower portions of the complex hole, which indicates that they have actually a narrower range of abiotic communities, abiotic um, conditions than they could. So finally, we found something that was significant, and so the species of Bignoni do indeed tend to occupy a limited portion of the complex hole uh, space predicted by their abiotic variables. So abiotic factors were really important in explaining community assembly for this group. So we had that one initial phylogeny that we used on all these different studies to understand patterns of morphological um, evolution, community assembly, biogeography, and but of course that phylogeny was no longer sufficient for us to answer a bunch of different questions. So now what we are doing is to focus on each of these different clades I have a series of students who are doing monographs and phylogenies for each of these 21 plates. And for each of these, we are so producing the phylogenies and solving a bunch of new um, taxonomic problems, lots of cryptic species that are peering through these detailed phylogenies. And this is also representing the basis of all the taxonomic studies and is also allowing us to test a series of different evolutionary hypotheses. So it's really neat that we are using the same methodology, everybody's scoring the same morphological traits, we're being able to build this huge um, matrix with morphological traits in which we score for each single species and each single individual in the matrix, and then we have the same markers and everything for, for all the groups. But of course, now that we're do, building these phylogenies, so the methods have changed and we can no longer um, reconstruct our phylogenies using just a few genes and they're not sufficient to resolve relationships, so we are using um, next generation sequencing to build those uh, phylogenies. So what I just wanted to show here today was um, that these phylogenies, so they provide a really great framework with which to test these hypotheses about the origin and maintenance of biological diversity. And I also wanted to emphasize that we should really take full advantages of the phylogenies that we are producing by combining those phylogenies with high quality data from many other sources. So not forgetting um, taxonomy, anatomy, morphology, geography, physiology, and in order to make, take full advantage of the advance, um, so we can really advance our knowledge about biodiversity. But we also have to keep in mind that these phylogenies are hypotheses and that the quality of our results will depend on the robustness of our phylogenies. And these empirical studies, like the ones I was showing here, um, they are really providing the basis for the advancement of the new theoretical studies that are in turn leading to more accurate methods of phylogenetic reconstruction. And then these new methods of, of phylogenetic reconstruction are allowing us to provide new tools for us to test the hypotheses that we had already generated. So it's very dynamic because when we finally think, okay, now we have the best phylogeny, there's a new method and we are always 